Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tracy Alexander. I'm the president of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight on behalf of BAFs and indeed our partners in hosting this event, the Royal Society of Medicine. The third lecture in this series is next week, so if you haven't booked that already, I would encourage you to look at both our websites and you'll see that both us at BAFs and the RSM have quite a schedule of exciting events over the year ahead, which is going to help us all get through this next period of lockdown, we hope. When you're looking at our websites, if you're not a member already, perhaps you'd consider joining one or maybe the other, or indeed both. Um, we've both got um, support and administration people who'll be able to help you with any questions there. But this evening, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Misha Dola. He's the director of the Center for Telecommunications Research at King's College, amongst so many other things, I can't possibly do them justice here. I urge you to have a look at his website because there are thrilling things on there, not least of which uh, are some recordings that he's made. He is a, such a talented musician and uh, pianist and composer as well, but there's no music this evening. Today, it's all about the digital. At the end, uh, we'll have some time for questions and answers. I would encourage you to keep those courteous and polite. I'm sure you all will. And I'll be curating those questions and answers and putting them to Misha at the end. So I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Thank you so much for agreeing to do it, Misha. It's over to you. Wow, what's going on out there and this uh, internet out there? It turns out uh, if you look at a typical day in the internet, we are clocking some 11 billion searches every single month. And uh, we produce uh, every minute, so every 60 seconds, we produce 20 hours of YouTube content. And we spend a lot of time writing emails. Turns out we are doing some 210 billion emails a day of which 80% are spam. Now, I'm not sure whether that is the official spam or whether that counts uh, also the emails which come from uh, your boss. But here you go, 80% of all the emails are spam. And uh, uh, as a result, there's a lot of, uh, you know, cyber stuff going on, a lot of, uh, you know, crime happening. And if we look at a 2019, uh, you know, uh, statistics here, we see that in the US alone, we have some 1.3 billion economic harm. And this is gonna grow by a fact of a, a 1,000 over the next years to come. Now, if you look at the UK specifically on the right-hand side, you can see that, that about 70% of uh, all cyber attacks which have occurred in the UK were directed at small businesses, 70%, just think about it. And of those, you know, almost 50% uh, have actually been successful. And the cyber attacks which were successful have put about 60% of the small businesses out of business within a few months. So these are, you know, uh, you know, very, very bad statistics. There's a lot going on. And what I thought of doing today is, to unravel a little bit what's what is happening in the internet how does it tick what are the you know the new trends what what are the technologies which emerge which will define this digital fabric over the next 5 to 10 years and I could probably talk about this for days and I had to cut it down to just some 45 minutes, unfortunately. So I'll be cherry picking some topics here and there. But in the very end, we're gonna put it together. And uh, the topics I've chosen are the topics which I think impact your community quite a lot. So the first, the very first topic we're gonna be dealing with today is uh, artificial intelligence, AI. I'm sure you have heard about this and uh, I'm sure some of you have been using it actually already. So the AI, the stage of AI we are in today 
is uh, defined as a so-called narrow AI. And it's called narrow because every time we want AI to solve a certain task, uh, you know, then we need to teach it very specifically. We need to train it to that specific task. We can't uh, use AI today to generally solve us problems or help us in our daily lives. We're still a bit away from that. And that AI is called general AI. And it's probably going to appear over the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years. And uh, then we are very afraid of another form of AI, which may emerge uh, some 10, 20 years later, which is called the super AI, which essentially, uh, you know, signifies the beginning of an era where machines learn quicker than we can teach them. Because that means that they will be accumulating knowledge and capability in an exponential way, and uh, you know we we have we have uh, we are very afraid of this doomsday because we really don't know how to deal with that because it's very clear that machines could very easily take over uh, humanity. So it's a lecture on its own. I'm happy to have it, but let's dive straight in and see how AI relates specifically to your field, the field of forensics. Before we do that, let's let's just try to understand uh, the main AI families. And I really hope I, I don't bore you with that too much, but I thought you need to understand really what, what is really ticking today in terms of artificial intelligence. And uh, we have roughly four families and they're very easy to understand. The first one is all around signal processing. So imagine you get data, medical data, you have some X and Y uh, uh, axes and you have some data plotted there. So you would use machine learning and signal processing to try to understand trends, relation, uh, you know, you want to understand what are boundaries, what are clusters. Uh, I think we all have done that. So you understand that world really, really well. It's been around for a very long time. Then somebody had a very genius idea and introduced the second family, which is now known as the deep learning family. And uh, what it does, it mimics our brain. So we have essentially some input neurons, we have some hidden neurons, and we have some output neurons which control something. So imagine, uh, you know, some of these input neurons representing my eyes, uh, then the optical feed goes through my eyes into my brain, which is my hidden, which are my hidden neurons, and then uh, certain decisions are being taken, and these decisions control my hands, my fingers, uh, my mouth, or whatever, right? So you can imagine that the more neurons we stuff in there, the more input uh, hidden neurons and output neurons we have, the more powerful uh, that deep learning um, engine becomes. And indeed, we have seen, you know, we have seen the emergence of uh, deep learning capabilities, such as by a company called DeepMind here in London, um, which is able to beat these days the, the best Go players, chess, chess playing is already, you know, a machine thing for decades, but the Go, there's a game, Chinese game called Go, where you really need a lot of experience, a lot of intuition, and this is where deep learning has, uh, has excelled. So it's being used quite a lot for image recognition, speech recognition, uh, games, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interestingly, taking deep learning uh, and taking two deep learning engines, okay, so two of these neural networks, and putting them together in a very really smart way, a third family emerged. And that's a very recent family. It's maybe, um, you know, six years old, and it's called GANs. These are generative adversary networks. They're called adversarial because you pitch essentially two brains against each other. It's a bit like we work in a team, right? So somebody has a great idea, you, you bounce it off somebody else, uh, and it goes on until you actually, as a team, come up with something extremely creative. So it turns out that these guns can be very creative. So what you see here specifically, and we come to this on the next slide, is something called deep fakes. Okay, so how do you create essentially faces of people who have never existed? Well, what you do is you feed into one of these uh, AI engines some random noise. It's the one which you see down there. It's called the generative engine. You feed random noise, feed it through the neural network. It fires something out. It fires an image out, which probably in the first run doesn't look like a face at all. And then you have another uh, AI engine, uh, the, the other brain called the discriminator, trying to discriminate between noise and the real face it was trained on. Now, the discriminator will probably in the first round say, you know, guys, this random noise doesn't look like a, a face at all. Uh, try again. And the uh, feeds it back and the general network does it again and again and does it a billion times, 10 billion times. And in the end, we come up with something which is so good that it fools the discriminator network. 
Okay, and this is how you start creating uh, these uh, artificial faces and people and uh, even art. We have been using it together with uh, Rob Del Naja, who is the uh, founding member of Massive Attack. Maybe you know him, he's a good friend of mine. We do a lot of stuff in the arts world using guns, right? So that's what's being used today. And there's an, another exciting family emerging called Explainable AI, which was uh, co-pioneered by my good buddy, Dan Magazzani, who's with us at King's. He's now the head of AI at JP Morgan, and it's all about trying to bring to life this human machine teaming, introducing states where a human can actually talk to an AI engine, the AI engine can talk to the human, okay? So in essence, what we get here is family one has given us the basic capabilities, family two has given us the intuition, family three has given us the creativity, and family four has given us that machine uh, human teaming. Now, what do we do with this? Would, we can do a lot of really exciting and good things, and um, I will show you a few things which are being done, uh, but they're also scary things you can do. And I think these scary things will be really impacting you as a community. So I'll be making references uh, to these in my lecture today. It doesn't mean that these fantastic tools cannot be used uh, for, social, uh, for social good. Okay, so let's look at one example, the first example, and it's about scaling uh, what we call situational awareness. And, um, you know, if you're into forensics and if you, if you are, uh, you know, into uh, certain principles of how, how police works, et cetera, um, or, or, or national security, situational awareness is absolutely instrumental. It basically tells you you're getting a lot of data and with that you're constructing, you know, the situation in real time, what's going on. Now, we were able to do this uh, fairly well with, uh, you know, huge um, kind, kind of armies of analysts uh, sitting behind screens and looking at whatever that is, whether you want to monitor a certain area, uh, just as now was the Biden inauguration, probably loads of humans there monitoring the situation uh, in Washington. But uh, you can also think of the seas, the world, uh, you know, other parts of the city. And um, I'll give you an example, which I know really well, because it's being done by one of my companies uh, called Sirius Insight. Uh, .ai, and we specialize in maritime situational awareness. So imagine the globe, the sea, and there's a lot going on, and you want to really figure out where's the crime happening, where are things happening which should not be happening, okay? And it's looking like for a needle in a haystack, because first of all, uh, the surface of the globe is very big. Uh, there are not so many ships out there, and uh, the majority of the ships are, are good ships. They behave really well. So how do you find now the, you know, the, 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 the ships which are doing something illegal? Well, we put AIS together. So AIS is just a little ping which each ship needs to transmit. It's a beacon, an automatic identification signal. Uh, we use radar signal, but we're not using traditional radar signal. We're using radar signals from space. So the image you see down here on the right-hand side is actually taken from a satellite. And the satellite uses radar, which can see through the clouds and at night it works really well. It gets a fairly grainy image back, but you see the ships on there pretty well. We then also put in optical satellites and optical cameras, which are often near the shore. And then we use AI to scan the seas 24 seven, trying to figure out if something is abnormal. So the ability for AI to detect ab ab abnormal events is very, very powerful. You need to train it properly, but it can do it. And what you see is, uh, is the yellow trajectory of a, um, a cargo tanker, which uh, um, not so long ago was on the way from Brazil uh, to uh, the, 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 the Netherlands, okay? It was to one of the ports in the Netherlands. And um, they naturally have to pass through, you know, the Straits in the UK. So there's nothing suspicious there. But suddenly we realized uh, that this uh, specific ship was actually slowing down. There was no reason for the ship to slow down. And it turns out that uh, uh, whilst it was going very slowly, there was another ship coming from the shores of UK uh, to essentially collect cargo, which were drugs. Okay, so these drugs essentially were then uh, brought uh, with a very small kind of boat, which was barely detectable, back to the shores of the UK, and uh, and the big uh, cargo ship continued uh, to the port in the Netherlands. So really, really difficult to detect, but AI was able to tell us that the situation here was a bit fishy, and then, of course, law enforcement uh, could react. So you can apply that scenario, of course, to anything you can think of if you're in the field of forensics, you know, as long as you can train your AI to do these very smart things, 
it will often, you know, flag you something suspicious. It may also flag you things which are not suspicious, but at least out of the billion of scenarios, you get something uh, to work from. What else do we have? Uh, something even scarier uh, or even more exciting. I don't know where to put it because I work a lot in the film industry, but uh, I, I want to show you something. Let's first watch this video. And um, I hope the sound works. Um, if not, we may need to reconnect. Hi, I'm Neon. Artificial human. It's a little bit different from an AI. I was computationally created based on how real humans look and behave. Every Neon has a unique personality, emotion, and intelligence. I'll help you find your style. I'll let you know what's happening around you. I'll guide your journey. I'll help you find your inner peace. I'll be someone you'll share your idea with. My dream is to help humans become even more human than ever before. So I'm not sure whether that was scary for you or whether that was exciting, but you have seen not the future, you've seen the present, okay? So this is end of uh, 2020. And if, I, if you were not right now in the context of AI, in the context of a slide which says deep fakes, you, 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 you would have zero idea that these humans aren't real. You have no idea. And they're being used now as news anchors. In Korea, they're using them currently as news anchors. They're being used to help you as a life coach. Um, and uh, you can do a lot of things with these. And uh, the company is doing that. It was uh, generous enough not to use real humans on this. But we have the tools today, and these are called the deep fake tools. Uh, just with a little bit of uh, material from a person, I can recreate the person. I have the audio signal of Tracy. I can now go to a website, upload 60 seconds of uh, Tracy's voice, and it would then generate me any, any type of text, narrate any text in Tracy's voice. So if I used that uh, AI and called up the bank of Tracy, we could fool them, no problem. Okay, the same with the images. I have images of Tracy. I could actually feed this into one of the deep fakes and uh, uh, generate an image of her. So I can construct a whole team's meeting uh, with Tracy, her real voice, with her real uh, visuals, uh, without her actually being her, right? So that's very scary because suddenly you start to understand that crime can be committed by uh, artifacts which aren't really humans, which are just the shield of humans. So therefore your, your face of forensics is changing completely in the future because you will need to deal with a, a totally different uh, fabric of society, okay? And it's coming more and more, uh, whether these are avatars, uh, these humans, etc. And in the US, in fact, uh, the government has been discussing, uh, you know, a, a how, how terrible the situation is and have uh, started with the Deep Fake Accountability Act, uh, which has not been passed into law, but is being discussed at the moment. And uh, the situation is so dire that uh, the likes of Facebook and Google have started a, a competition which is uh, looking for algorithms which is able to detect whether a deep fake is a deep fake or no deep fake. Okay, so the problem we really have is we lack a platform of observation to understand whether what we are seeing is real or not real. So therefore, that is now a very interesting time where both regulation and technology are dancing a tango to try to understand, you know, what's the way forward. Clearly, this has been created with uh, good, uh, you know, good intentions in mind, with good ethics. But as we all know, as you specifically know, all that technology can be abused and used in a very criminal context. And this is what you need to be aware of. Okay, and I'm actually sitting now in front of you, uh, presumably, you know, quite a lot of doctors. I wonder whether the world of, uh, you know, of, of medicine will change, whether you will be taking into your Royal Society of Medicine, people in the future who are able to kind of deal and operate on uh, these digital humans. Okay, so people like me who are creating, uh, you know, these digital artifacts. Anyway, that's something for you to think about. But uh, you understand that, you know, that type of technology is very, very powerful. It's nothing of the future. It's something which is happening today, January, 2021. 
What else can that technology be used? Well, for password hacking, as an example, I'm just picking out a few examples here, but so you just get the idea. And uh, interestingly, you know, if you if you want to get to a good database of passwords, you just uh, type it into Google. You type GitHub, okay, the website you see here, GitHub, uh, you know, um, password list, and you get actually millions, uh, if not billions, of passwords to download. These are the most typical passwords people use. Now you feed that into a GAN, which I remember uh, remind you that creative engine and in fact the specific uh, gun has been created is called pass gun and it is able to actually guess people's password out of context out of you know whatever gather intelligence it can gather about the person uh, it gets a password a reliability of 46 percent this is scary okay so basically if we use this engine on the audience who's right now listening in almost every second one of you we would be able to hack into your system into your computer Etc. So, therefore, AI will not only be used by the law enforcement agencies to help with situations like these, but will also be used by criminals and will gain access uh, into the system. So, therefore, bear in mind, you know, the landscape is changing, and if the law enforcement uh, does not keep up in, 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 technolo in technology capabilities, the, the, the criminals will overtake you very quickly. So you have seen just a few examples I had given you right here. Right, so where do I see an opportunity here when we put it into context of forensics? So on the left-hand side, we see the more deep learning general AI. So this is about feature detection, right? So doing prediction or prevent something, minimize human errors in general. So imagine that potentially, you know, pictures are taken from a crime scene uh, or certain traces are being uh, taken or unstructured intelligence is being gathered. It's being fed into the uh, machine learning engine and it will tell you something. It will say, look, there's something here, which you haven't really paid attention to, or there's, you know, there seems to be, um, you know, there seems to be a, a, a certain, uh, you know, a certain effect here or something, you know, so these engines can spot a very, very specific incidents. Now, on the right hand side, you see the guns, okay, and the guns are, as we said, are very creative. So you can imagine that they start creating from the intelligence they, they are being presented, uh, what I call they start creating quirky scenarios. And that's something maybe we as humans uh, probably really suffer from because we start to create scenarios uh, what may have happened based on our experience, okay, based on our experience. So we might be getting better as we grow older, but, uh, you know, often, and I'm sure if you're in the field still active, you will know there are a lot of very quirky scenarios you have never considered. So GAN is that machine element, which is very creative and yet somehow unbiased, which is able to potentially give you these scenarios um, and uh, not as an evidence, but just as an inspiration for you as a human forensics person to take it from there and work on that. And XAI, Explainable AI, brings it all together and is able to narrate that relationship with the different uh, artificial intelligence engines. So, so overall, I really feel it enables personalization and it enables the scale to really solve cases at scale. And if it's being used well, removes human biases. So I'll leave that for you to think about, to ponder about, but that I think is a great opportunity when AI is being used properly. Right, so let's move on now. And let's move now on to a field called uh, blockchain. And I'm sure you have heard of Bitcoin and Bitcoin is based on blockchain. And you may wonder why does Misha present blockchain, you know, as part of this forensic session? So uh, bear with me, just, you know, if you, if, if you wanna learn what it's about and how it relates to you, bear with me. Let, let's get started. What are blockchains? Well, blockchains are essentially ledgers, okay? They're like books, um, like a traditional ledger, but just digital. OK, and uh, they are public. Uh, typically, they are also private ledgers, but generally they are public. So everybody can read them. These are open books, a bit like the the ledgers you had, uh, presumably in churches 300 years ago, where we wrote down who was born or who died. Right. So uh, they were there. They were public. Uh, but the difference to the church ledger is that actually these digital ledgers are distributed. So they're distributed all over the world and they are immutable so you can't change them so whilst you could sneak into the church and you could rip out a page or you could just uh, erase a certain entry you cannot do this with the digital blockchain okay you can't do that and why is that well because we were really smart engineering this okay and this principle of immutability is based on two two principles which is chaining and distribution 
So the chaining, how it works, uh, it is essentially, uh, you know, putting blocks, digital ledger uh, blocks together. OK, it's a bit like your church ledger. OK, so the pages or any book, as a matter of fact, the pages are being held together by a glue. All right. So therefore, that makes sure that page 42 is in front of page 41 and comes, um, uh, and, sorry, page 40, 43 and comes after page 41. So the glue uh, in the book holds it all together. Now, in the digital world, we don't have a glue, but what we have is, is what we call ciphers. And these ciphers hold these uh, blocks together. And each block contains content, any content. You can put what you want. You can say Misha was born uh, or Misha uh, is owing somebody some money or Misha is paying somebody uh, or Trace is being paid by Misha, etc. You can put anything you want there. It doesn't really matter what you put in there. The important part is that these blocks are being linked together by this digital glue where we use essentially, uh, you know, cyber, uh, uh, cyber, cyber functions. So uh, uh, cryptographic functions such as hashes. OK, I don't want to go into details. So now imagine I have created this, uh, this, this chain of blocks on my computer. What do I do next? I distribute it all over the world. So everybody who's part of my uh, fabric is essentially taking a copy. So if I, uh, I could imagine, and in fact, with Bitcoin, that's the case. There are like billions of computers these days, which keep the exact copy of the blockchain, uh, which represents Bitcoin. Yes, it's a lot of data, but we have distributed that. So therefore, if somebody wanted to go back in time and modify one of these uh, ledger contents and say, you know, ten year, uh, five years ago, 100 Bitcoins were not paid from this person to this person, they would need to go to billions of computers, uh, go back, uh, hack into the cryptographic functions to make sure all the links work, and it's just computationally impossible, right? So this gives it its power because once it's, uh, you know, carved in a digital stone in a sense, you cannot mute it. Uh, uh, um, uh, you can't, can't change it, right? So it's really immutable. All right, so what do we do with that? Well, we can create as a, as a result of that, we can not only store content, but we can create money because it is something which is, uh, you know, really taken care of from a value point of view. And you will have heard of Bitcoin, but there are many others. And Bitcoin has been going up and down. And it's now recently just hit a single Bitcoin, a value of $40,000, which is really crazy. It's fallen ever since, but it will go in, in, in waves. And people predict it's going to be worth maybe in 20 years time, something like 500,000, if not $800,000, uh, uh, one Bitcoin, right? We don't know. Uh, we'll come to this later because maybe Bitcoin will collapse. Uh, but so far, it's really growing. Uh, I was lucky I bought some in the very early days. So uh, here you go. I'm guarding them uh, very dearly. So you, you're creating, you don't have real money, right? So you can't touch it. So what is it? It's just an electronic address in this digital fabric I just shown you in the ledger. OK, that's what it is. So um, if you know your Bitcoin address, you could literally take a browser, which is belonging to this digital fabric, and you type in www, whatever, I'm making this up, right? Michelle.com slash Bitcoin number one. And it would show you the value of this Bitcoin. You should never show that to anybody, by the way, uh, but it would represent that. And you store them in wallets, but wallets aren't really physical wallets. They're just literally a bookmark. They contain the addresses uh, to your Bitcoins. OK, that's what it is. Now, what do you do with that? Well, you can go out and exchange them. There are loads of ex exchanges out there. And the biggest one is Coinbase. Uh, there are uh, exchanges like uh, Draken, et cetera. So quite a lot of exchanges where you go and you can take your Bitcoin, you, you bring it there, you exchange it for another cryptocurrency. You can even exchange it for real money or you can exchange real money for Bitcoin. So you have all these combinations. It wor works almost like a fiat uh, Forex exchange, uh, but is essentially with a uh, cryptocurrencies right so why am i telling you all this well because it is really a perfect ingredient for money laundering or for an absolute privacy where it's absolutely untraceable what people do i just want to show you how this works so even though the first leg of the cryptocurrency world is really well regulated 
So if you tried to open a crypto, uh, crypto account uh, totally anonymously today, you wouldn't be able to do it. You need to do a proper KYC, so know your customer in AML, so any, uh, any money laundering uh, you know, exercise. The bank or Coinbase would vet you. You need to submit your, you know, your bill, your, 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 your proof of address, your passport, everything. Only then they open your cryptocurrency account. And if you buy cryptocurrency, the address of the Bitcoin is actually uh, totally linked to you. So if you have bought a Bitcoin from your Coinbase account, everybody will know this Bitcoin was bought by Misha. But what B Misha could do is he could change a, at the Coinbase, a Bitcoin into a Monero coin. It's a different coin. It's a very privacy, you know, privacy, uh, uh, privacy driven coin, which essentially the moment uh, you feed money in there, the, uh, the trace of ownership is completely erased. Okay, so that's how Monero works. You can read up on this if you want to. And in fact, what people do is, uh, like to do is, they assign a Bitcoin, uh, you know, they, they trade a Bitcoin for Monero coins, then they trade more Monero coins for other Monero coins, they shift it for wallets, it's called a wallet cycling, um, and suddenly, you know, that money is completely anonymous, right? And then you go back to an exchange, you exchange it for Bitcoin, you go then, uh, you know, to a, an ATM, so there are quite a few ATM, ATMs in London already, which accept uh, Bitcoins, you take out the money, et voila, nobody knows who you are, who it was. Of course, you need to do more things uh, to stay completely anonymous if you go in the city and withdraw money. But you get the ideas. You can do other things. You can buy weapons, you can buy drugs, etc. Nobody can actually get this through. If you use a tool, so the dark web uh, capabilities, you stay completely un anonymous, right? So maybe you knew this already, but I just wanted to show you that you know the introduction of uh, digital cryptocurrencies was it gives a lot of opportunities uh, there's a lot of uh, you know there are a lot of challenges and a lot of headaches for you to come and specifically now with China introducing its very first cryptocurrency uh, a state owned cryptocurrency this becomes very interesting because nothing which forbids uh, a digital yuan to be changed in the Monero ecosystem into something very virtual and of course we will not be talking about uh, 10 10 dollars here we're talking and possibly about money laundering of hundreds of millions. So therefore, you know, I want you to be aware that these tools exist. Right, what else is going on in the internet? Well, um, quantum, okay? I understand I'm pushing you a little bit here today, uh, but I hope, you know, that type of technology remains interesting for you. So listen me out, quantum technologies. Right, so what is quantum? Quantum is really uh, freaky. We don't understand it really. We don't really know why it, it works like it works, right? And Einstein actually called it, you know, the most freaky experience uh, he has ever in, in, in encountered in his life. It's, it's based on two principles. Uh, the first principle is the principle of superposition, the one we'll be using. And the other one is the principle of entanglement, um, which essentially for reasons we don't understand uh, particles which might be billions of kilometers away and apart from each other are getting into an entangled synchronized state, right? So we don't know why that happens, uh, but it does happen. It's been measured, it's been proven, it's out there. But we're gonna concentrate on the first one, which is superposition. Now, why do I mention that? Because it helps us a lot in augmenting our very digital world. Our digital world is based on zeros and ones, on bits, right? And uh, this is basically coming from classical states. You have no current, it's a bit zero, or you have a current going through electronics, which is a bit one. So we have these classical states. Now, quantum is very different. It can actually uh, you know, get into a superposition state at once. It can have many different shapes on one and zeros in one go. And uh, the, uh, the degree of uh, freedoms you have here are called qubits, right? So if you have, uh, you know, uh, four qubits, it's two to power eight states you can get in. So you can build essentially a quantum state, which is quite powerful, loads of qubits. And uh, today we have quantum computers, which get in the order of thousands of qubits. So in a single state engine, we are doing something what probably two to the billions, what are billions of classical states required to do. So that's the power of quantum machines, right? And why, why do we love this? We love it because it allows us to solve exponentially difficult problems in linear time. 
Okay, so linearizing problems is very, very important because you often end up in scenarios, whether these are scenarios like yours, where you need to come up with an optimum set of parameters to, to evaluate a crime scene, or whether you use it in a medical context where AI needs to gauge whether there's cancer or no cancer, or whether that is my world where, you know, I need to optimize a certain telecommunication systems. Uh, you often are going through billions, if not trillions of different states. In the past, we have dealt with that by finding heuristics. So heuristics are good, but not, not perfect. And uh, we want perfect. And this is where quantum comes in. I'll give you the example with this very famous traveling salesman problem. And you will be shocked what's happening there. So it, it, the task is very simple. So the task is, look, I'm going to give you a few cities. I tell you how far they are apart. And then you need to find the optimum path uh, of a traveling salesman such that uh, he or she visits every single city and that the tra distance traveled is uh, minimal, okay? Now, we have loads of heuristics for that, no doubt about this, but if you wanna do it really uh, you know, optimally, so if you have 14 cities, so we're not talking about a huge amount of cities, 14 cities, uh, my computer can do that probably in 100 seconds. You're not even doubling this to 22 cities. It takes a thousand years. Okay, a thousand years for a normal computer to do that. And if you increase that to 28 cities, it takes billions of years to do it. There's no computer, no classical computer who can handle a mere 28 cities optimization problem. Now think of your world where your parameter degree of freedom is well beyond 28. And uh, it's very significantly more complex than that. So therefore, we are very keen on getting these quantum computers solving these problems in linear time. <clears throat> these quantum computers aren't very quick. So don't get me wrong. They're not like, uh, you know, Terra, uh, you know, a billion of operations per second. They do maybe one or two operations per second or maybe per, per minute or per hour. It doesn't really matter. But the operation they do is so powerful that they are able to solve us essentially these very uh, difficult exponential problems. So that's great. But here's the headache. All right. So here's the headache. It turns out that our entire digital encryption systems depends on the difficulty, uh, this exponential difficulty I'd shown you, okay? So your emails, web services, financial services, everything, even the Bitcoin system depends on this difficulty. And specifically with encryption, what we do is, you know, when we start uh, a session, just when I started my Zoom session today, or you started your Zoom session today to make it very secure, we had to exchange some keys. And to exchange these keys, we are doing first a public key exchange. So we are sharing publicly a number. Now this number is very large. And it turns out that this number is uh, essentially the, the product of two prime numbers. And these prime numbers are gigantic. They're very, very big, okay? And since we don't understand prime numbers really well, uh, we don't really know, you know which prime numbers have been used to generate this very big number but quantum computers can solve it. So the moment I'm sending my public key and a quantum computer intercepts that public key, a uh, quantum computer is, be, is able to, to actually factor it into these two prime numbers and is able to crack any subsequent sessions which are being established. This is very serious, okay? This is really, really serious, which is the reason why all the governments are keeping uh, a very close eye on quantum, on quantum computers and quantum companies, on quantum capabilities, because everybody would like to have quantum supremacy, as we call it, and would like to have nobody else to have that capability, okay? Now, where are we today? We are, we are here. We are already quantum is here. It's working, okay? The pioneer in the field was a, uh, was a Canadian company called D-Wave. And um, you can actually sign up to their quantum compute program. I did it, right? So you don't get a lot of time. You get like five minutes distributed over a whole month, 60 seconds each to really make sure you don't go for cracking financial systems or solving complex Bitcoin problems, okay? Uh, but you can do it, okay? You can have, use D-Wave today. Uh, in the meantime, 
you know, companies like Google, uh, you know, have really been built, building huge quantum computers. IBM has been doing it. Loads of Israeli companies doing it now. But the ones who are leading the field are the Chinese. Chinese uh, fired up a, a satellite which already works on quantum computing. So it's absolutely hack proof. No matter what you do, you cannot hack it. The communication between the satellite, uh, Chinese satellite and the ground station. Okay, and they have just announced a few days ago that they have built the very first quantum internet. So it's unhackable, right? So therefore, these things evolve at the moment and quantum computers emerge. And just recently also China has emerged, said that they have built a quantum computer which is a billion times more powerful than Google's best quantum computer. So they're able to solve very, very complex problems now and the, the, the world will catch up. It will be like with the big uh, compute farms that sometimes it's the East, sometimes the West, sometimes somebody else. So, you know, I'm not too worried about this. What I'm, I'm worried about is, is, is that, you know, this capability will have a profound impact onto security uh, and on cybersecurity and therefore on a lot of things which impacts you personally as well as professionally. Right, do we work on this? Yes, we do work on that, you know, and specifically I do work on that because um, we, we will be transiting two worlds. So currently we are in the world, which is a you know, world where we have quantum computing already, and, but we are still working digitally. Okay, so there's still plus and uh, uh, zeros and ones going for the ether, protecting us, sending this Zoom video call, etc. cetera. And, and you zoom forward 20 years, in the future, everything will be quantum. Okay, I, I have no doubt about this. So my computer will be a new computer, will be quantum computer, then my, mo my mobile phone, which maybe will be something else, will be a, you know, quantum driven. So that's all good. But what's happening in between? In between, we will have legacy systems, which are still the old digital thing, you know, and uh, we also have quantum capabilities in the meantime. And that's bad news because I just explained to you that it would be able to crack a lot of these security ciphers, etc. So therefore we at Kings, we started working on novel cryptography, digital cryptography, which is impossible for quantum to hack. And we just published a really interesting journal on this in case you're interested, I doubt you are, but just in case you are, uh, there is a journal, so we work on this. I just want to assure you that, you know, we, we're trying very hard day and night to come up with solutions which essentially help us in this transition period. All right, so let's move on now to uh, my my last topic of today. And, uh, you know, that is 5G. And I could talk, you know, hours and days on this. Uh, I built a whole company around this, actually, educational company around 5G. Um, I know this world really well because we built UK's very first operational 5G system. And... Um, and it's about networking, clearly. And 5G is a really exciting system because it allows us to do things we weren't able to do. And it allows us to bring in all these components we discussed, whether this is, you know, quantum uh, or whether that is, you know, distributed ledger or AI in a really interesting way. Now, I'll show you in a moment how, how it all fits together. But before that, I would like to share you a little of my view on how the telco industry evolves. And uh, we are very fortunate. It evolves in trends. I'm sure your industry also evolves and trends, but ours is a very steady trend. So it's, there's always something as we go from 1G to 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, now 6G, and something always improves by an order of magnitude, right? So um, the, the, the latency goes down. So meaning the time it takes between you clicking on a website and getting the response always improves by a factor of 10 or 100. Uh, or your ability to, to transmit a video improves by a factor of, of 10 or 100, right? So therefore we see that steady increase and 5G is really so interesting that it's not only able to serve the consumer market, so you and me uh, transmitting videos, uh, whatever, you know, you, what you can think of, but also industry and specifically industries, uh, heavy industries. So, um, you know, if you want to, for instance, operate a mine uh, remotely, you can do that with 5G. Or you may want to uh, also use it in your world. In fact, together with Proka Dasgupta, who is a professor at King's College London, we have pioneered that whole notion of 5G robotic surgery. You can do this now. You can literally democratize that uh, surgery skill around the world. Um, so that is a really interesting thing. The other thing I have to say, which uh, we have always observed, is that it always takes as one generation to consolidate the idea. Okay, so in 1G, we had this ingenious idea to have, uh, you know, cellular communication systems without any wires. And uh, we didn't get it right. It was 2G which got it right. And 3G, we thought, let's connect the internet. 
I didn't get it right, but in 4G, we got it right. And in 5G, we said, let's get it ready for industry. So maybe we need to wait for 6G because the odd generations, for some reasons, are always very odd. But we are where we are. And we, we started to put things together. And it's one of the new internets I've been designing for the last years. So I believe in this notion of this internet of skills where, you know, we have an internet where you as a human can transmit the skills you're best at, right? So whether you're good in forensics or you're good in, in surgery or you're good in playing the piano or in, in uh, you know, painting, uh, whatever you do, you should be able to transmit that through the internet with using touch, right? So touch and, and muscle movement. And, and you think, oh, Misha, you're crazy. But just zoom back 20 years. You know, if you told a person that in 2020, they will be able to stream Netflix uh, films on their phones, I would have said, you're crazy. So we are there. We have the robotic stuff. We have the AI stuff. We have the quantum capabilities for the computational stuff. We do have the networking stuff. We can put it together. And I believe in this, you know, and we have started to, to build loads of prototypes uh, to, you know, kind of build this internet of skills, which I think will really change the way how the internet will work over the next years to come and and normally after this slide i have loads of wonderful slides of what you can do with that and uh, maybe you want to watch on the, the, the stuff on my website for you though today i want to look on the other side what could go wrong potentially by using an internet where you can execute skills uh, uh for it right so it turns out that in the back there's a lot of cyber security going on naturally and uh uh, you know, unless you're skilled in the arts, you will think, you know, when you hear about, um, you know, systems being hacked, you will think that agencies get into the telecom systems, listen to your phone calls uh, by hacking in Well, they don't need to. There's actually a whole standards initiative around it. I'm showing you this document here. Uh, it's a very long document. It's one of the longest documents in the in the in the five G standards ecosystem, uh, and it's called Lawful Intercept: The Architecture and Functions. So whenever you know a government agency has a a, a um, the right, the legal right to actually go uh, and intercept a call, they would uh, actually get in touch with the operator, and the operator would then give access to the uh, to the specific call uh, or to the websites which have been browsed, etc. Now, the interesting thing is they can't do anything if there's an end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, so that's why WhatsApp or Signal uh, or Zoom end-to-end -end encryption is really, really the big topic debating now, uh, including the UK Parliament, where there's been an argument to actually weaken the end-to-end -end encryption. No need to say that I'm really against it because criminals will know how to do the encryption properly. So you will not get it. You will just make the system weaker and make it easier for criminals to essentially take over parts of the system. But I just want to show you that Lawful Intercept is really well developed. Well, as it turns out, we spent a long time on 5G trying to get the security right, but again, we got it wrong. And the reason is because the system is so complex. The, the, the systems we build these days are so complex, which is why you have so many vulnerabilities, right? And um, uh, in 5G, we had 11, we have a few, uh, few less now, but there's still quite a few troubling flaws which could be uh, essentially exploited by criminals. So therefore, you know, the crimes will shift more and more into this area of wireless connectivity because more than half of the world's traffic is, is really originating from there. And interestingly, you know, the last thing I want to talk to you about is really this deep packet inspection. So what does deep packet inspection mean? Uh, a lot of the, tra the traffic which is going through the internet is, is being transmitted in, in packets. They're called IP packets. And they are typically encrypted, okay? That's how you want it. So nobody can read it. Nobody understands what's going on. But it turns out we actually have tools which are able to guess with a high fidelity what's being transmitted. Okay, so that is both an opportunity for law enforcement, but also very worrisome for the privacy of citizens like you and me. So therefore, I wanted to just show you, you know, these type of capabilities and, you know, the Internet of Skills, uh, putting all this into perspective, uh, we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. And I think, you know, the recent assassination by Israel uh, on the uh, third Iranian nuclear scientist using robotics and AI to essentially uh, do the execution just shows how powerful this digital fabric has become when it comes 
to activities like these. So I think you, the, the, you know, your world will really shift with the emergence of technologies like these. And I, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry if I came across sometimes a bit negative, but I just wanted to show you what's going on behind the scenes and how it will impact you as a profession. But overall, you know, I can tell you is a wonderful, wonderful capabilities coming over the years to come. If the only thing you take away today, the internet of skills, democratization of your skills, the very same way as the internet has democratized information, that would make my day. All right, I'll leave you with that. Uh, these are these are actually the views from our offices, right? So those who have been to Kings will know that. Most welcome to visit me after the COVID crisis is over. Thank you for staying with me and I hope it was interesting at least in part. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. I don't know whether to be terrified or exhilarated. I'm really glad that you, you decided to end on a high there. So we have got some time um, for questions. And uh, as I'm in a position of power here, I'm going to start with one for me. Um, could you do me a deep fake of me? As <laughs> I've got this Teams meeting tomorrow, and I have no idea what it's about. So a Teams version of me is going to do just as well as I might by acting. I have to say, my dear attendees, this isn't actually Tracy talking. She's now a deep fake. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you just, you know, you, you say it as a joke, but Google it. It's fairly easy. It's, it's, it's remarkably easy. So, yeah. We may have to talk about this offline. I see, I see great possibilities. Okay, back to some serious questions. So um, the first one, I'm going to do them in, um, in chronological order because they okay. came as you were hitting this. Yeah. Um, so the adversarial networks, the GAN, mm -hmm. I thought this as well. I must have missed it um, when you said it. What is the G for? Uh, a generator. So uh, basically, I've cut it out because I, I didn't have space with the phone. The G stands for generator. So you have two AIs. One is generating stuff, and the other one is trying to prove the one who's generated that it's wrong. Okay, that's why they're called generative adversarial networks. Got it, got it. And I mean, that that was sort of slightly terrifying as well with the two. <laughs> so, so does that happen a lot? Are they, are, they, are they numerous? I mean, how often do you encounter that? Yeah, so they're, they're being used actually really a lot, specifically in the creative industry. So as I mentioned, for instance, if, 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 you, if any of you happens to be a Massive Attack fan, so, and you were at, at Rob's concerts in the last two years where he did the Mezzanine, uh, you know, uh, concert, he had a lot of deep fakes there on, on stage and they were actually rendered and our compute farm where he has politicians actually trump he used trump and overlaid some other text you know rob's very political so it's they're being in the creative industry a lot and i think they will be emerging also now in the digital industry like my industry where we are specifically using them for generating scenarios which is where i had the idea that this could be very interesting for you as a community to come up with a, a quirky yet plausible scenario so that's why i brought it up so the massive attack thing, I think, I, I, I guess I don't personally feel that, that that's a huge risk to society um, because it's there and, and he's going to tell people, yeah. but look what I've done because it's, yeah. it's genius. Yeah. Um, if he didn't, would we be able to tell? Yeah, so for Rob's concert, you would be able to tell. It's quite visible. Okay, it's part of his grainy, uh, you know, artistic way, and uh, maybe later I can show you a video of that. But the, uh, in general, as you have seen, so there are companies like Nvidia. If you if you Google Nvidia, uh, you will see they're really behind the whole compute and algorithmic infrastructure of these deepfakes, and they're they are so good now that they have announced that they're able to do the Zoom calls. Uh, now recreating your faces and your emotions you're talking without transmitting the actual video data. Okay, so you were laughing about this, but that's what they're trying to do. Because the moment you're able to essentially send a 4K or even holographic image of you speaking, you don't need to cl clog anymore all the networks. Uh, and it's essentially deep fakes, which are generating, you know, my face on your end and your faces on my end. And we can do that to, the, to a degree of fidelity you just don't know anymore that, that it's real fake. Somebody sent me a deep fake of Julie Andrews recently, and the only reason that I knew it wasn't actually her is because she would never use that kind of language. There you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good one here about Bitcoin um, part. So can you buy Bitcoins on the dark web without going through the KYC AML? Oh, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, we'll, t we'll take that one aside. I know the person who asked that one. Maybe I can put you guys in. <laughs> okay. 
Mm. So we've talked about lots of uh, lots of areas, lots of challenges. So if you had to pick one, um, like a main challenge, worry, what keeps you up at night? What's what's the thing that's causing you most concern? Yeah, it is the quantum the quantum part, and uh, you know, it's it's really you know the the ability of quantum computers to to a build something which is basically un, untraceable entirely right so it can build a fortress where by the laws of physics fundamental laws of physics you cannot get in and at the same time it by the laws of physics it is able to destroy everything else so quantum quantum is something which really keeps me up and i know a lot of politicians as well uh, and business people so we need to act very quickly to come up with solutions um, and in fact the, the the real problem we have is we assume that you know these quantum hacks are something of the future we don't know whether they're happening today it might already be ongoing that you know the calls messages uh you know the financial transfers are intercepted and maybe modified right so quantum computers could do that so that is what keeps me really what keeps me really up yeah Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try not to think about that before I go go to sleep tonight. Uh, right, this is this is an interesting one. Won't we always need to retain legacy systems to preserve access to data stored in these ancient languages, even after the development of sophisticated, ubiquitous quantum computing? Oh, that's a great question. So. Uh, you know, we, we don't really know how to go about it, but uh, what we decided as a community to build something, what we call these museums of old tech. So essentially we are storing, you know, uh, 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 images of this old technology in the way that we can always go back. So probably just very few of you will remember uh, hot disks, right? So hard disk where you actually store data on, um, you know, I, I use them quite a lot. I still have some upstairs. Uh, I can't really deal with this anymore, but there are places now in the world where you can actually go insert that stuff and then, uh, you know, I, I retrieve the data again. So we're trying to, from an engineering point of view and computer science point of view, we're trying to keep these uh, museums of vaults of uh, you know data backwards compatibility. And as um, as time goes on, we're getting better with that because we start to design now systems really uh, thinking uh, future proving. Okay, so now a lot of design thinking is happening in in along the unknown unknowns because even today when we built six G, for instance, and I'm arguing a lot for that. Um, you know, in 6G, we need to build mechanisms in there which allow us to take care of technologies which yet need to be uh, invented. And uh, there are certain design methodologies which, which allow us to do that. Of course, it's not uh, bulletproof per se, but we're starting to think of this future proving. So it's a really great question because we have accumulated so much data knowledge and leg through these legacy systems that at some point it will become, it will become a huge issue. Yeah. That has led me beautifully uh, to the next one. How long? For 6G? <laughs> so we started uh, maybe last year. Uh, we always take, for reasons I cannot explain, uh, you know, at least eight years. So um, probably 20, 2025, we will announce the very first tech solutions. In 2028, you will have it. So 5G, we have been working on since 2012, 13. So it takes a long time until it really goes out. But once it goes out, you know that it will work everywhere, right? So whether you are making a phone call in London, on Buenos Aires, in Washington, in Beijing, or in Sydney, you know it will work. That's that. That's why we spend so much time on that. Okay, it'll be worth waiting for. Yeah, that's the message I'm taking away. Great. Um, can AI or other technologies help in detecting missing items, such as aeroplanes, or maybe a missing person in a mass fatality? Yeah, it it can, it, it definitely can. So I mean, the, the rule is very simple. You know, uh, the, the 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 better data goes into the engine, and the better it is being trained, the better is the output. Right? Rubbish in, rubbish out. Uh, good data in, rubbish training, rubbish out. Okay. So it's like it's like us humans. Okay. So that's what it is. So therefore. If, you, if you're able to build an AI with the right model that's being trained, and we're getting better with the training to these days, um, uh, uh, typically it took us, you know, and specifically for the examples uh, which, which you have given, a missing person, 
uh, or an airplane missing, right? You don't have so much data. You don't have billions of data points of missing people or of missing airplanes. You just have a few. And we have now invented, our community has invented this, what we call a one-shot learning so that the engine learns from one single experience. And the moment you feed in new data in there, it would be able to help you with that, okay? So it is, it is, it is possible, but it all depends on the, uh, on the data you, fe you feed in, yes. But I think it's very powerful, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from uh, one of my team members um, who's very new to policing, but uh, clearly keen and has loved your presentation this evening. Um, so thank you from, from us in, in City of London Police, as well as everybody else. Um, what more could be done to keep forensic police services and other services up to date with the trends? Mm. Apart from money, because I don't have any. <laughs> No, no, it's it's a it's a really great question, and I think you know education programs like these are, are um, absolutely instrumental. And I'm very grateful that you you called in, right? So because it's really out of your shooting line per se. Um, you know, I I think you know the, the training centers are good, and it's our mission at university to do that. So the, I think a very low cost, and I'm sure you know I'd be happy to do this for free to give you these uh, regular updates. Um, it is really just finding this willingness and time out of your entropy of life because you're all very busy just to carve this out and say look i'm gonna now spending time to upskill i do this i i just i love it okay i i'm upskilling every day uh you know admittedly in my community but this is how i learned about you know bitcoins and quantum and all this it doesn't didn't come naturally and i think just in in instigating you know this culture of upskilling that will help and naturally you will learn things on the way and start putting things together, starting to, to ask the right question, involving the right people, writing the right grant proposals as green papers to the treasury and suddenly get the budget to do what you want to do. <laughs> um, we've got a question here relating to the discussions we were having about um, 5G and 6G. So this questioner asks, should we really be spending a lot of effort on 5G and 6G when a large part of the country only has access to 3G? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, a very good question. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm responding now uh, in my position as being on the board of Ofcom. So we spend a lot of time discussing that, that specific issue uh, in, in, in Ofcom. So we had a lot of troubles of getting a good coverage, uh, uh, you know, out in the country. And this is really... It's a question of business model, but it's also a question of uh, how the legislation has been written, uh, because, in fact, the operators needed to provide 99% coverage, but this was, uh, you know, just coverage, essentially, for, uh, you know, 90, 90%, 99% of um, um, uh, of usage. So in other words, how can I put this? So if you live in a village and uh, most likely you will have a decent coverage there, just, you know, at least you can make some phone calls. But the moment you're starting to walk over the hill, which you do maybe one hour a day, uh, you will have no coverage at all. And the operators are not violating their contracts because uh, they're essentially keeping their 99% coverage requirement uh, intact. So um, with the 5G licenses, things have changed slightly and uh, we hope it will get better. The business case remains very weak. So the operators, in fact, even for the operator to roll out anything out of the deep urban environments is almost not worth it financially, right? So uh, therefore we need to force them all the time. We're also looking at other models which have become now possible with 5G and they're called neutral host models. And essentially with uh, 4G and before, you really needed an operator such as Vodafone or EE to come there, build the mask, put the base station, connect it with a fiber, uh, and then use their spectrum to serve you. Now with neutral hosts, you can actually have the village uh, buy uh, the mast and uh, you know do all the connection and then uh, essentially ramp up its own telco ecosystem within certain areas they want to. So it can be used in industry if you want to uh, you know power up your factory or in the village. So we hope this will change it. And the other hope we have is that uh, companies like which which can do a global coverage, you know, and um, global coverage like uh, you know likes of Elon Musk maybe with uh, with uh, with the Starlink he's building. So building entirely new telecom infrastructures to facilitate these not spot as we call them. So I'm, I, it will still take time. I think that that will really take time. So I'm really sorry if you live in a, in a, in a, in a very remote area, but we are getting better. We're starting to understand more and more within Ofcom. And Ofcom is really trying very hard to make sure that the consumers in the country get, get good coverage with 5G and, and onward and upward. 
Fantastic. Um, we're getting quite a flood of questions in, but we only have two minutes left, sadly. So um, I'm just going to do it as fairly as I can. We'll make this our last question. Is there such a thing as ethical AI? Mm. It's a two part question. So you've got to say yes, no, or maybe to that first. Uh, we don't know. Truth is, we don't know. I just did a policy paper for, with Cambridge on this, and I could spend another five hours talking about this great question. And the question, the answer is, I don't know. We don't know. Okay. In which case, um, the question about whether it can be built in or not is got to come later. <laughs> so we're going to get you back to talk about um, the rest of the things that we just haven't had time for today. So thank you again. It's been great. Um, the comments coming in, people are texting me and sending little messages saying, oh my God, he's great. And you are. I'm really, really grateful that you said yes when I asked you. So thank, thank you. you. We will be in touch soon on uh, other topics and um, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to um, Helena Thornton for um, helping us convene this really great series. Thanks to the tech support and I hope you all have a really great evening. Bye for now.